Hi, I'm Meg Riley with the Church of the Larger Fellowship. I'm usually in Minneapolis, but they've got a blizzard going on, so I beat it out of there. I'm on Long Island uh, in Queens, New York right now. I am at the International Council of Unitarian Universalists. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but first, let's have our regular folks introduce themselves, and then we'll introduce our special guest. Hi, I'm Joanna Fontaine Crawford, and I am here in my office at First Unitarian in Houston. Hey, and I'm Hank Perth, and I'm in my office here at the First Parish Church United in Western Massachusetts. And this is Scott Yeomans coming to you from Springfield, Pennsylvania, um, with the Church of the Larger Fellowship and a seminarian at Star King. Scott is often behind the chalice. He's our tech guy a lot of the times, although we're about to switch that off. But I've also invited him to be part of today's conversation as we talk to Dr. Jeff Wilson, the Associate Professor of Religious Studies and East Asian Studies at the University of Waterloo. And Jeff knows more than about anyone about the history of the intertwining of Buddhism and Unitarian Universalism. Jeff, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. That's great. So let's just start with talking about Pete Seeger for a minute. That's that's on a lot of people's minds. This week, Joanna, you blogged about that, and you posted a Facebook comment that's picking up a lot of steam. What do you got to say? Yeah, I, on one hand, um, yes, I am I am one of the people who is also grieving this loss and, and thinking about how my life was affected by Pete Seeger, how he affected the world. I mean, I, I really think this is a person who um, lived out his values, which I think is the, the highest calling for all of us. Um, on Facebook, though, I got into a discussion with some people because I... I know a lot of uh, worship leaders and ministers are going to be talking about Pete Seeger this Sunday, and there was some interesting tension um, between certain generations, but it's not necessarily generational. Uh, I mean, I'm Gen X and a, and a fan of Pete Seeger, but also kind of your cultural context of whether you you know, whether Pete Seeger was a big force in your life. And I saw some comments that kind of implied things like, well, if you don't know who Pete Seeger is, that you're not a good you you. So I posted something to say, okay, watch what you're doing. Let's not alienate people, especially because Pete Seeger, who did not want to alienate anyone, who, you know, when he was called before the uh, the Committee on Ameri Un-American Activities, made a point of saying, I'll sing for anyone, any group. So let's not alienate anyone, guys. Hank, what do you got to say? Have you, have you been talking about this? I haven't followed it, if you have. It's, well, I, I haven't, in part because I was away at the uh, the, the Freighters of the Wayside Inn. Uh, on, uh, of the, uh, the, uh, why don't you just pause it. and tell people what that is, because I bet a lot of people don't no, know. No, it's, it's better not to. No, no. Um, the, <laughs> the Freighters is this, um, uh, it's a ministerial study group. Oh, trying to, oh, wait, I want Joanna to laugh tea out her nose. That was good. Um, uh, it is a, uh, a study group that was started in uh, 1902 by a group of universalist ministers, and it's been meeting yearly, um, starting in 1903, we've been meeting yearly at the Wayside Inn, which is this, uh, this like, old 18th century inn in Sudbury, Massachusetts, and um, the, the uh, number of members is limited to the number of uh, beds. <laughs> so... Um, uh, you're a member for life, and uh, and it's a membership is capped at 20, and basically you have someone has to die before you can get in. <laughs> so, um, uh, and and actually, uh, uh, and and actually, while I was there, uh, James Ford um, uh, gave a paper. It is a study group. James Ford gave a paper and talked about Jeff. So I feel I'm 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 really up on uh, on on what Jeff's going to talk about. Um, but I did miss. We did. You know, we we obviously we heard about uh, Pete Seeger's death, and we thought and people you know sort of mentioned it. Um, but I wasn't on, like, you know, on the on the internet, you know, as, as it were. But as someone who grew up, uh, you know, my, my mother um, uh, is a professional, uh, uh, traditional folk uh, storyteller and, uh, and and folk singer. So, um, you know, certainly grew up, you know, around his songs and, um, you know, and, and yet at the same time, also, you know, we were we were more into a traditional uh, uh, folk music. Um, and and uh, you know in, in time uh, uh, and, and my mom's also British so it was a, a we were more into the British Isles things but certainly you know grew up he spoke at my uh, 
the Quaker high school that I grew up at, that I went to, that I graduated from, and you know, uh, in in uh, Poughkeepsie, New York. So he was certainly, you know, um, part of my growing up. But uh, you know, I, I, I um, you know, I also understand that for you know, uh, he meant more to a lot of people than he necessarily meant to me. But uh, uh, a great guy, and just you know, always committed and always um, living his values, and and, and what, a, what uh -huh. a fantastic man, fantastic, fantastic man. You know, and a great legacy. Only, and you kind of go 94, yeah. 94 years, excellent. God bless yeah. him. Let's, yeah. Now it's our now it's our turn to do the work. You know? Yeah, I only met him when he came to GA, and often I was privileged to be part of the team that got to meet. Back when I worked at the UA, I got to meet the celebs who came to GA, and and what I was just struck with was, and I said this on Facebook, how much he just was giving every bit of himself. You know that that notion that you just use yourself up, and and he was. He was sort of felt like a little grasshopper. I mean, he was really light and and little, and just felt like every ounce of life he had, he was just offering to the world and this amazing legacy for all of us. Now, Jeff, you were saying you went to community church when he was there in New York. Uh, yes, that's right. I uh, was a member of a community church of New York in, uh, I guess, the the later uh, '90s and uh, around the uh, turn of the millennium. Um, and he uh, he was a a member at that time. He was not uh, frequently present at uh, services or anything like that. But you know, people in the in the church were aware that he was uh, part of the uh, the larger community there. That's great. Yeah, I know Janice Marie Johnson feels really close to him, and from that time at Community Church is is really grieving. But it's through people like Janice Marie who he encouraged that he's. Uh, He's still with Unitarian Universalist as well as everyone. He he was a true Universalist. I think probably everyone's claiming him right now. Scott, how about you? Do you have any connection to him at all? Uh, you know, I grew up with his music, um, certainly uh, through Holly Near and uh, her concerts with him. I've enjoyed his music. And then most recently, I wanted to lift up uh, Paul Winter, the musician, uh, sent out a uh, posted a tribute on his blog, uh, oh. highlighting the song "To My Old Brown Earth," which is just a really, uh, which was written for the funeral of uh, David McMan or I'm sorry, John McManus, back in 1958, oh. and it's just a really beautiful, moving song, especially in light of his own uh, Pete's own passing. Yeah, oh, that's that's really cool. Yeah, I saw that harp group. It was Holly, Arlo, Ronnie, and Pete. Right. Yes. Did you see them too, Joanna? And they yeah. came to Minnesota when the the spam, the Hormel meat people, were striking. So we all went out to Austin, Minnesota, and it was this weird mix of like lesbians and striking meat packers, and and the music was like all mixed up too. And it was just one of those times, like whoa. And I think that's what he did was really just cross a lot of boundaries that, you know, uh, he just did that his whole life. It's really quite inspiring. So, yeah. So I know uh, CLF we're putting together a special video, of course. You know, so <laughs> Shauna Foster's working on that, and and I think probably in a lot of churches this week he'll be he'll be lifted up as a as a model of really giving away everything you've got. So what what more could you do with a life? May we all live to be 94 and do the same. So I wanted to mention this cool place I am, not not this hotel room, which really there's nothing to recommend it, but this conference that I'm attending, the International Council of Unitarian Universalists, um, if there were better Wi-Fi there, I would be over there and pulling people in because it's so much fun to meet Unitarians and Universalists and Unitarian Universalists and co-religionists from I think there are about 30 countries represented, and um, and what I love about it is you just can't assume what it means to say, you know, that you're Unitarian or Unitarian Universalist because it's interpreted so differently, and it really gives you the opportunity to separate culture and religion in some really interesting ways that um, that are inspiring. And also, so we worked with Beth Zemsky, who's done this thing about. Um, cultural competence and um, and I said on Facebook I'd settle for cultural humility because I there's no way I could be competent even really with one other culture I you know um, really and then to think of all the different cultures here but but what she's talking about is how to develop skills of listening and not assuming and paying attention and stepping back and being aware self-aware and all of those things. So I didn't envy her up there facilitating a bit. Hey, look who's here. It's Patrice. 
Hi, Patrice. We thought we weren't going to get to see you today. Glad to see you. And soon I'll be glad to hear you, too, I think. <laughs> I should have said earlier that Patrice wasn't coming, but here she is, so I, I shouldn't have. But I will say that Tom Shade could not come today, so he will not be joining us. Patrice, lovely. I know you thought this wouldn't work, so fabulous. Yep. So I thought so, I would drop in. I might have to leave a bit early, but I'm very glad to be here with everyone. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'll let you introduce our special guest. I mean, I said his creds, but... Um, okay, great. Uh, Patrice did the invitation here, and that would just be a lovely segue. We're just kind of, I'm talking a little bit about being at the ICUU meeting, and we've had our grief about Pete Seeger, and oh. we're just, just moving on to talk about the history of Buddhism and Unitarian Universalism. So, yeah, why, don't you, why don't you lead well, in with that? I, okay, well, I'm thrilled, although I'm still having a little, few technical difficulties. Ah, there you are. Sorry, I couldn't see anybody. Ah. Jeff! It's so nice to uh, meet you in person. <laughs> Hello, thank you. Um, I was a student in Jeff's class on universalism, and it was just absolutely fabulous. Uh, opened the door, uh, I don't know, to, my, to greater understanding for me of our history of universalism. Jeff is uh, one of those fantastic professors that really knows how to do online teaching, and I know all of us who live in the online world really appreciate that. Hey, I was in that class too. Oh yeah, that's that's right. Wasn't that a great class? Awesome. I, it was fabulous. I, I am still trying to track down, Jeff, some of the documents from that class because I didn't realize that they would disappear from my online account after a certain amount of time. In any event, uh, also Jeff is a fabulous uh, historian on Buddhism in the United States, which is I just found really interesting reading your essay in, uh, what is it called, the Buddhist, Buddhist Voices. I was looking at my bookshelf. So with that, I think I've, I hope I've lauded you enough. Uh, <laughs> we'd love to just uh, hear you talk about the intersection of universalism and Buddhism, and as yeah. you know, we're kind of freewheeling, so... I've already warned Jeff that Good. we might interrupt him, but <laughs> yeah, we'll give it a try, <laughs> Jeff. No, we'd love to hear. We'd love to hear you just kind of where you would start to talk to us about such a big topic. Yeah. Very good. So uh, my impression is that there was a uh, there was a session uh, later last year uh, that discussed uh, maybe uh, Buddhism and uh, Unitarian Universalism as a, as a general topic. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. It was more about practicing than history. And your name was brought up. Yeah. Okay, so uh, some of this may be familiar, therefore, um, but uh, maybe in my role then as a historian, I'll try to inhabit that a, a bit more. Uh, there's there's sort of uh, different stages in the history, really. There's, uh, there's recent history, which has been uh, quite fruitful and interesting. There's uh, also... Uh, I guess you might say uh, ancient history, uh, relatively speaking, that goes back to the 19th century. And uh, there's there's plenty of uh, sort of uh, interesting uh, things that occurred uh, in between as well. Um, there is this uh, volume recently out, uh, Buddhist Voices and Unitarian Universalism, uh, part of a series of um, uh, voices from different theological uh, perspectives, or really different uh, religious uh, traditional perspectives. Uh, within Unitarian Universalism, that uh, there's uh, been a volume on uh, Christianity, another one on Jewish voices. Um, I believe there's some others as well. Uh, so this Buddhist uh, project was uh, in in that uh, in that series, and um, I had two contributions in there. One was more of a practitioner sort of uh, uh, reflection in that way, and uh, the other was uh, uh, an opening essay uh, detailing uh, just some highlights of uh, the long. Uh, uh, very intertwined history of uh, Unitarian Universalism and uh, Buddhism since, um, well, really, actually, uh, you can trace it back uh, even to um, uh, the later uh, 18th century, uh, believe it or not. So um, uh, the problem probably is that uh, once I get started, I'll go uh, far past uh, my allotted time here. So. Um, Maybe I'll try to uh, mention a few highlights, and then uh, I am quite happy to be uh, interrupted or ask questions uh, in the classroom, uh, something that you wouldn't have experienced in the um, online course, unfortunately, but in my uh, physical classrooms, 
a very uh, back and forth uh, dialogue style, uh, even of lecturing. So I expect uh, uh, to be uh, interrupted and to be uh, guided uh, by uh, students' interests uh, very much. So perhaps we'll be able to replicate that a little bit today. Um, so I'll, anyways, I'll jump in here. Jeff, yeah, go right ahead. If you have say, a question, uh, uh, get me started, uh, and that's just fine. Well, what I was thinking is that um, there are probably are a lot of folks, or some folks anyway, who haven't read your opening essay. Um, and maybe just uh, some of the highlights of the connection between um, American, you know, the United States, um, Buddhism coming here, universalism, Unitarian universalism going to Japan, just some of those highlights just to give people an idea of those connections, I guess, which are pretty amazing, probably surprising to a lot of folks. Sure. So, um Perhaps it shouldn't be uh, too surprising to us that uh, uh, Unitarians and Universalists, especially uh, Unitarians, I would say, uh, were instrumental in uh, first exposing uh, Westerners, uh, especially uh, Americans, uh, to uh, ideas uh, about Buddhism, eventually ideas and practices uh, from Buddhism, since they tended to be part of uh, a, an intellectual elite uh, in uh, New England society, especially. And uh, we're also uh, very much uh, uh, part of the uh, maritime trade, which, of course, was the uh, primary engine of uh, economic growth for uh, the New England region for centuries. Well, uh, where are these sailors going to? Many of them are going to Asia, specifically to China and to uh, other uh, Buddhist nations. And therefore, uh, people are being exposed to information filtering back from people who've been in Buddhist Asia. Uh, people back in, in uh, uh, the colonies and then in the early American Republic are being exposed to information, sometimes uh, items uh, even uh, brought back uh, quite early uh, in the story. And um, Sorry, so what kind of items? Well, uh, these might be things like, for example, uh, carved um, uh, ivory uh, Buddhas. Uh, at first, uh, things that uh, uh, sort of uh, bought or picked up in uh, uh, Asia and brought back. And then uh, before too long, as a, sort of a, uh, an interest uh, grows in the West for these sort of trinkets, uh, the Chinese and others are actually uh, producing these uh, for the consumption of Westerners. And so you'll find um, over time they, they begin to be uh, less, um, what would the term be, orthodox perhaps in uh, their presentation style uh, because they're being sort of churned out not for devotional use by Buddhists in Asia, but uh, rather there be there sort of um, uh, 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 kitsch or trinkets or something like this uh, art objects, uh, uh, maybe at the higher end of the scale, uh, like dream for, catchers uh, today, uh, uh, unknowing barbarians back in the West, right? So uh, uh, it's sort of interesting, and and Unitarians among others are bringing these back as mementos, or in some cases actually selling them. Uh, uh, again, uh, mainly on the uh, East Coast uh, uh, in uh, New England. Especially. Can I just ask in what spirit that was done? I mean, would you would you characterize that? Hank mentioned dream captures, and certainly we see a lot of New Age white people selling, you know, Native American things. I mean, w was it done in a spirit of respect, curiosity? I, you know, wh how would you characterize the interaction with with the? You know, I, I'm just curious because. It's still going on, but I, you know. Sure. So, um, let me see. Just making sure I'm not muted. I had it muted a moment ago. Okay, I seem to be uh, coming through. Uh, although Meg, I for some reason can't hear you. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, cultural appropriation or misappropriation is a, is a major uh, concern for us these days. I've spoken on it uh, myself and published some essays uh, uh, in this area, but it's not. Uh, something that we should uh, anachronistically uh, project into uh, the past. Uh, the truth of the matter is cultural relativism as an ideal is a very recent one, a very recent human idea. There were no human cultures uh, in the 19th century or any time previously that thought in uh, the sort of terms that we do today. In fact, our ideas about relativism, about uh, appropriate or inappropriate use of other people's cultures and so on, these evolved out of the uh, earlier experiences of uh, colonialism, imperialism, and so on, uh, that that caused people eventually to begin to think along these lines. These are not ways of thought available to people in the past, and that includes Unitarians. It includes uh, the other cultures they were encountering as well. Um, 
So uh, in looking at the, that sort of um, material object, uh, I understand the point about uh, dream catchers. Uh, my impression, though, is that dream catchers today, these things we see sort of uh, sold in New Age shops and elsewhere, and I won't say that um, they're necessarily inappropriate, but certainly there can be inappropriate um, uses of them. These, my impression is that uh, these objects are produced um, not by uh, Native people themselves, and that uh, Native people often do not have strong control over uh, the production, consumption, reception of these sort of uh, objects. Uh, you know, they've, they've sort of uh, been, they have a further life beyond their origins, right? When we're talking about Buddhist objects, um, essentially these are things, uh, in this earlier time period, these are things that are uh, perhaps being uh, purchased by um, sailors or merchants who are um, in port somewhere. Uh, they're in uh, uh, Siam, they're in uh, China, uh, so on, you know, and um, uh, they're just curious about things and uh, people, you know, have them lying around or willing to sell them. And then eventually as, a, as an industry develops, then what you have is people on site in uh, Asian cultures um, actually producing them for the use of people uh, in the West. Essentially, they're not seen as genuinely religious objects by the producers themselves because traditionally a Buddhist object becomes uh, a, a devotional object um, when it's actually uh, uh, has a, a ceremony that's performed upon it. It's essentially enlivened. Uh, uh, there's a, what they call an eye-opening ceremony, which converts it from dead matter to being essentially a type of sacred living object that genuinely is imbued with the actual spiritual power of whatever uh, you know uh, exemplary figure. Uh, this Buddha, this Bodhisattva, whatever that it represents. And that's not what would have been going on with these things. Of course, it's the same thing today. If we go to um, uh, um, a hardware store, uh, we'll find uh, garden uh, Buddhas and uh, Guanyin and uh, other figures there uh, that are being uh, produced sometimes in Asia, but uh, they're not seen as true devotional objects because they haven't had that further uh, process. It's sort of like um, bread is bread is bread. But if a priest gets a hold of it and does a particular ceremony over it, it becomes uh, the flesh of Jesus Christ, right? Until then, it's just bread. Well, from the Asian Buddhist perspective, uh, so you've carved something that looks like a Buddha, that's great. But it's just wood, and unless it has been subjected to this further sort of process. So I, I think maybe that's uh, uh, something to know. Anyways, actually, this material stuff is mainly a tangent, because although some of this flows back to the West, um, uh, what we first got was um, uh, eyewitness uh, accounts of people observing Buddhism or, or Buddhists uh, in, in Asia and attempting to understand what it was that they were encountering. Some of these people were missionaries, uh, some of these people were traders, uh, some of these people were uh, colonial uh, bureaucrats, uh, for example, um, uh, British uh, administers in, uh, in uh, places like uh, Sri Lanka and India and places like this. So there's a, there's a, there's a wealth of information flowing back to the West, and uh, Buddhism is, is included in this sort of thing. And as, like I said, since the Unitarians are part of the intelligentsia, they are reading these reports from abroad. They're interested in them. They are relatively more open to uh, uh, learning about other cultures on a relatively more even playing field. Um, than uh, many of the other uh, Christians around them at that time, uh, Protestant or otherwise. And uh, so eventually this will evolve from curiosity at first, where we see things like uh, uh, Hannah Adams in her uh, late uh, 18th century and then uh, some uh, ish, uh, editions in the early 19th century. Her early uh, dictionary of all religions uh, of, of the world includes information about Buddhism in there. She, she was a Unitarian. Uh, also the first woman uh, in North America to make her living off of uh, her own uh, uh, writing uh, career. Um, and then in, uh, by the 1840s, with the uh, rise of uh, the Transcendentalists and so on, the Transcendentalists, as we know, uh, largely a uh, sort of a breakaway, uh, we might almost call it a, a Unitarian Reformation in a way, because uh, uh, really without exception, uh, all of the transcendentalists were either Unitarians or from Unitarian families or closely allied with Unitarian institutions, um, despite their anti-institutional rhetoric. Uh, so they became quite interested in Asian uh, religions and practices, really which it's called in world 
because uh, some of these were ancient Middle Eastern ones, others were contemporary Asian uh, things. And so you get situations like in 1844 in the Dial, uh, the uh, premier uh, uh, transcendentalist publication uh, under the editorship of uh, Henry David Thoreau. Um, so Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, a Unitarian uh, transcendentalist, she published the first uh, English uh, translation of, uh, of a partial uh, Buddhist scripture, an extract from the Lotus Sutra. And uh, what is actually the uh, extract that she publishes? It's uh, translated, by the way, into English from French. The French translate, translated from uh, Sanskrit originally, if I remember correctly. Um, she chooses specifically a section of the Lotus Sutra, one of the major uh, scriptures of uh, uh, East Asian Buddhism. She chooses a, a section which talks about how the reign of the Dharma, this is to say the Buddha's uh, teaching, uh, falls upon all of the plants in the world, uh, whether they're tall trees or short uh, ferns or anything at all, uh, that this uh, uh, Dharma rain falls everywhere and gives nourishment to everyone in whatever their situation may be according to their kind. So it's a very interesting sort of thing for her to choose out of this uh, quite long and diverse uh, scripture. She, this Unitarian, goes for a passage which speaks to a sort of uh, universality and uh, also an individuality of all the different practitioners in the world, all being benefited in uh, appropriate ways by uh, spiritual sources. So uh, to me, that's a, quite a Unitarian uh, move that she took uh, at that time in, in choosing that scripture uh, to translate. So we might say that um, there's sort of a first stage of curiosity, and then people begin to very selectively look at Buddhism and find some inspiration. Um, and then uh, later, uh, by the end of the 19th century, um, rather than just reports filtering back from Asia, uh, Unitarians and then Universalists will be actually going to Asia, operating in Buddhist Asia, uh, operating missions and uh, other uh, sort of uh, forms of uh, cultural exchange. And uh, then there will be very direct encounters, uh, which will reshape in some ways Asian religion and will also have some impact uh, on, uh, on these uh, North American uh, traditions as well. Uh, is, are you seeing a kind of distinctly Unitarian Universalist Buddhism um, that is emerging? Yeah, I would say so. We certainly find that today, anyways. Um, it, in terms of uh, earlier time periods, what we find is, um, at first, there's a type of uh, Unitarian uh, Buddhism, which develops in Japan, uh, primarily by uh, Japanese uh, reformist Buddhists, who take principles from uh, Unitarianism and use them to reform uh, Japanese religion um, at the time when Japan is emerging from uh, 250 years of cultural isolation. It's been uh, forced open by uh, the American military and uh, now Japan is open to the outside, they, they uh, uh, invite Unitarian missionaries to come to uh, Japan as part of their modernizing uh, strategy, and uh, they help to establish some of the first um, uh, genuine sort of uh, Western-style uh, universities, uh, technical schools, English language schools, and, and other uh, uh, sort of key institutions like this. And uh, Unitarianism is seen as a set of uh, essentially principles for how to approach religion. So they take that Unitarianism, as they understand it, and apply it to uh, the Buddhist traditions that they have at home. And uh, these uh, sort of Japanese intelligentsia uh, begin to reformulate what Japanese Buddhism uh, should be in the, for the modern world. Uh, these are not obscure people. These are people like uh, Fukuzawa Yukichi, who converted to uh, Unitarianism. He um, uh, he's on the 10,000 yen uh, note today. I mean, he's seen as one of the founding fathers of modern-day Japan. Uh, it founds a, a Keio University and has Unitarians teaching there. Um, among their students are many prominent um, uh, Buddhist reformers uh, who will eventually be the ones who not only reform Buddhism in Japan, but become some of the first missionaries of Buddhism to people in North America, to the West. And therefore, the Buddhism that we receive uh, in the uh, uh, 20th century from Asian countries, especially from Japan, is in fact a pre-unitarianized form 
uh, in many ways, which has already been subjected to processes of sort of a liberal uh, religion in Asia and then exported uh, here. So when it seems so, um, it seems so appealing to us uh, uh, in uh, liberal traditions, well, that's because we're not looking at uh, traditional Buddhism as it might have been practiced, say, in the year 1800. The Buddhism being exported to us is, in fact, a, I mean, this really quite literally, unitarianized, not simply modernized, but unitarianized forms of Buddhism then presented as traditional Buddhism, of course, uh, to us uh, in the West. This is certainly okay. true of the Zen tradition. Uh, we find this in Pure Land traditions as well. Um, they've already been subjected to a change process that we're actually unaware of, because a monk shows up and he talks about Buddhism, and we think, oh, my goodness, uh, what an enlightened religion. Uh, the Buddha was practically a Unitarian himself 2,500 years ago. Uh, this is amazing. Well, of course, um, there's a little more complicated story to it than that. I just wanted to just pause and say uh, the world is an amazing place. That's all. I think this story is just... Uh, you could not have created a movie with <laughs> with that kind of storyline in it. It's just it's pretty phenomenal. And and Jeff, um, uh, I, I don't know if you actually went and spent uh, uh, time, but I understand that you that you you, uh, you explored a lot about my hometown of Fairhaven, Massachusetts, where um, uh, which part of the opening of of, uh, of Japan to uh, you know outside of the military also was the. Uh, um, uh, was, was the rescue by um, uh, a New Bedford whaling ship of, uh, of uh, a, a, a young man named Manjiro who uh, came and, and who uh, eventually ended up at the Unitarian Church in Fairhaven where my, where my father grew up. So uh, wow. um, I, was, I was quite, uh, I was like, oh, I've got something to talk about. This is good. <laughs> you know, and, Hank, and are, really there, are there cool, any thing. remnants of that at all, of, that, of his time there? Or did you know about this before... Just oh, like oh, yeah, yeah. No, this was, you know, it was one of those things like, why is the emperor of Japan coming to Fairhaven? You know, the, 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 those questions came up, and um, and my father certainly, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, told told me about it. I mean, I knew it as a child. You learned a little bit about it in school, but my father knew more about it. Um, uh, growing up in the Fairhaven Church, um, where I guess the the um, the the whaling ship captain that who rescued uh, Manjiro and a, a few other people from their ship that had um, uh, uh, sunk, um, brought him to Fairhaven. Everyone else was sort of dropped off in Hawaii and went back to Japan, but uh, the, this young man, Manjiro, came back to Fairhaven and, um, uh, to be educated and stay with the family. And when they went to, a, I don't know if it was the Congregational Church or the Methodist Church, um, they were told that uh, because he was uh, not European, he'd have to sit in the balcony and um, uh, with other colored people and, um, uh, and the uh, the ship captain was sort of outraged by this and went around the corner to the old, um, uh, now, now the old uh, building uh, of, uh, of, the, of the Unitarian Society in Fairhaven, um, where they could sit together as a family. And um, so I, I was, I, I, you know, so you know, I knew this, um, and then knew that he went back to Japan, and that was part of the um, the opening of of Japan to the West. Um, but then when uh, I heard, you know, all of these stories. Uh, of of uh, I didn't I didn't understand I didn't realize quite the extent of of his impact back in um, uh, the Japanese court um, uh, imperial court uh, uh, as as much as as it was the, the greater impact until this past week. What did I get wrong, Jeff? What did I get wrong? No, oh, that's a very good <laughs> overview. Yeah. So um, uh, what Hank is talking about here is a uh, is young man named uh, named uh, Manjiro. And uh, uh, this is a, one of those very interesting stories. At, at the same time that uh, uh, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody is translating uh, Buddhist sutras uh, for uh, Unitarians and Transcendentalists back in Boston, uh, meanwhile, of course, uh, the whaling trade is uh, one of the uh, major industries for uh, Massachusetts, as well as my home state of Connecticut, really uh, built upon the whaling trade uh, in the 19th century. And um, so in 1844, Japan has been closed uh, to outsiders for 200 years. Uh, this is due to uh, the pernicious effects that uh, originally the uh, Roman Catholic uh, missionaries uh, had on uh, medieval Japan, essentially. And so they closed uh, uh, this, the uh, country to outsiders. 
um, and they uh, made it illegal for, uh, number one, for people to practice Christianity, which was seen as a subversive uh, force in society. They also made it illegal for uh, foreigners to arrive in Japan on pain of death or for people to leave Japan again on pain of death or if they do leave for some reason, they cannot return again on pain of death. A lot of pain of death, in, can I say. So, um, uh, and in fact, they had a, a test for this that maybe I'll mention in a minute. Well, uh, despite the fact that things were illegal, uh, sometimes life happens. Um, uh, a small fishing vessel was uh, fishing uh, in the uh, Pacific Ocean off the east coast of Japan in uh, 1844, and um, was blown off course uh, by a storm, ended up uh, shipwrecked on a small uh, 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 island, and uh, as it so happened, an American whaling vessel eventually uh, found the survivors there, uh, took them aboard, uh, treated them nicely, and uh, returned to its uh, port in uh, the Sandwich Islands, what we know as Hawaii today. So um, uh, among them, there were, there were various people. Most of them were dropped off at that time. They couldn't go back to Japan. That was, of course, illegal. But uh, one of them, a uh, young, uh, young uh, adolescent uh, named uh, Manjiro, uh, was uh, a very intelligent uh, youth. Uh, he uh, proved to be quite useful aboard, uh, aboard ship. And so uh, the captain uh, took him under his wing and decided to bring him back as a, basically an adoptive son uh, back to uh, New Bedford, uh, his home port uh, in uh, Massachusetts. So uh, when they returned, uh, as uh, uh, Hank uh, mentioned, um, the, uh, his local church, uh, Methodist, if I remember correctly, um, uh, refused uh, at first to uh, admit him and then uh, 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 suggested that uh, they might uh, uh, be so magnanimous as to seat him in uh, indeed what was uh, the colored section at the time. Uh, Captain Whitmer was uh, unwilling to uh, do this. He saw this as, a, as an insult to his charge. And uh, so he took Montero and himself out of the church and to the Unitarian Church uh, across the river, if I remember the geography correctly, and uh, they became Unitarians. So this is the first official uh, Japanese uh, person to set foot on American soil. Uh, uh, quite by accident, but uh, this is how karma works, right? So uh, he was uh, raised as a Unitarian. Um, he, of course, was from a, uh, a mixed uh, Buddhist and Shinto background, as the average uh, Japanese person would have been at that time. And uh, he became a Unitarian, and uh, it was given a full uh, Western instruction, and uh, eventually uh, made his fortune, actually, in the gold rush out in California, and uh, returned uh, via Hawaii, was actually returned back to, um, uh, to Japan. Uh, when he arrived there, of course, he was treated with suspicion because he had been abroad in the land of the barbarians, and uh, not only that, even worse, the Christians, who were known to be an evil and subversive force that had nearly wrecked the nation uh, during the uh, 16th century. So um, he was subjected to the uh, test, uh, uh, which was... Uh, to stamp upon a uh, metal uh, plaque of uh, the Virgin Mary. It was known that uh, Christians, uh, due to the experience the Japanese had with Roman Catholics of an early era, that they would uh, not uh, be willing to step upon a, a holy image of the Virgin. Uh, they also used images of Jesus as well. Um, and uh, therefore they would expose themselves and they could be dealt with appropriately. So they're very worried about this uh, manjiro. Yeah, uh, he speaks English now. He wears Western clothes. Uh, he actually uses a Western name at times. Uh, he has all sorts of knowledge from abroad, and he is in fact a Christian. He's a Unitarian, so uh, but he's not going to broadcast that very much. So they put him to the test. Hey, go step on this picture of the Virgin Mary. Well, of course, the Japanese only have experience with uh, uh, Roman Catholics of an earlier era. They have no idea about the diversity of Christianity and Unitarians. They just don't care about saints. So he's like, yeah, bring it on. I'll dance all over that thing. And he passes the test. Because specifically he's a Unitarian and not some more, frankly, devout form of, uh, of Christian. He's able to uh, basically keep his head uh, uh, attached to his neck. So, um, that could uh, be our motto. Still stamping on Christianity after all these years. 
<laughs> What's that there? Sorry, that could be our motto, stamping on Christianity for all these years. I, no, suppose I so. don't course, mean that to be anti-Christian. I'm, I've been hearing from a lot of Christians who feel that way this week from Transylvania. So anyway. Uh, well, uh, of course, from his perspective, uh, uh, Mantra was a very sincere Christian. And uh, things such as uh, saints and images and so on were corruptions which had developed in, uh, and degraded Christianity. Unitarianism, uh, in a sort of a William Ellery Channing style, had returned Christianity to its proper uh, purity uh, and back to its roots. Uh, this was his perspective on things, right? Uh, nonetheless, he retained uh, clear uh, influences from his uh, Buddhist upbringing as well, we have to say, making him essentially the first hybrid uh, Buddhist uh, Unitarian. Uh, uh, you know, would would be uh, this uh, fellow Manjo. Anyways, so to make a t-shirts, we need t-shirts. Shorter. Yeah, uh, yeah, Hank. T-shirts, GA. T-shirts, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, one thing we might note. Uh, this is just this is just a, an aside. But since the racial <laughs> issue came up uh, about his uh, seating uh, there in New Bedford, uh, he is, so far as I have been able to determine, he is the first known uh, uh, Unitarian person of color on record. I'm not aware of earlier Unitarians. The Universalists, uh, of course, had a longer history with this. Uh, the very first uh, Universalist church uh, founded in Gloucester in Massachusetts in the uh, 1780s was founded with uh, African-American members. So it was an integrated tradition from the beginning. Uh, this is not to suggest it didn't have its uh, many stumblings along the way in between. But uh, Unitarians uh, had been an all-white tradition, uh, so far as I understand it, up until uh, Manjiro. Uh, so an interesting uh, milestone, not only in Buddhism, but also in the racial history of uh, liberal religion in North America. Anyway, so he comes uh, back and, and he... Oh, go ahead. Joanne, go ahead, were you going to something? <laughs> go ahead. I was just going to ask Jeff about, um, in Japan, if there's... Um, any understanding of this history that you're talking about, or any knowledge of? Uh, there is. You know, I would connect. not say that his religious history is well known uh, to the average Japanese person, but Manjaro is is known as a as a cultural hero. Uh, he returned um, with uh, knowledge that Japan, cut off from the outside world, um, ha did not have. So he had, by their standards, very advanced knowledge about. Um, uh, geography, about cartography, about mathematics, about uh, various uh, cultures that the Japanese were unaware of. He had technological knowledge, uh, everything from uh, uh, certainly uh, related to uh, uh, seafaring, since he had spent time uh, aboard a modern uh, whaling vessel, uh, knowledge about uh, foreigners' uh, weapons, about their advancing science, all this sort of thing. Um, and he also knew about their, uh, uh, in his mind, their reforms of uh, religion and so on. So he, uh, he actually became, he went from being a suspicious figure to a uh, trusted figure uh, with, the, uh, with the elite and uh, a sort of a, a posse formed around him of people, younger people, influenced uh, by his ideas, by the, uh, by the Unitarian, really, quite frankly, um, culture which he had brought back with him. These people went on to, uh, among other things, be inter uh, integral to the uh, revolution which occurred then in the 1860s, which uh, uh, brought Japan officially into the modern age. And uh, one of these people is uh, that person I mentioned before, uh, Fukuzawa Yukichi, who uh, would go on to make uh, major educational and governmental reforms. Uh, he, because of Manjaro, he was um, inspired to become a Unitarian and invite Unitarians as missionaries to employ them as professors in his university and so on. So uh, Manjaro is a, there's a, a quite direct uh, lineage there, which leads uh, to important parts of uh, Japan's uh, modernization and its uh, liberalization uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And um, then those missionaries come over. They're quite interesting, too, because... Uh, the Unitarian missionaries beginning in the late 1880s, so this is a generation later, they had a, quite an outsized impact upon the religion in, in Japan, especially Buddhism. And uh, uh, especially what they helped is that they helped the Japanese to understand that Christianity, which they had only experienced um, uh, in its um, more sort of evangelical Protestant missionizing modes, now they encountered uh, Christians who were uh, not seeking to replace their religion or convert them or 
uh, turn them into uh, sort of uh, uh, zombie uh, Westerners of a type. But um, the Unitarians came uh, with the idea of uh, mission as cultural exchange. They're quite explicit in their founding documents that they were uh, seeking to bring uh, the best of the West to the Japanese and that they were seeking also to uh, learn from the best of the Japanese so as to uh, benefit uh, as well from the encounter. So they were attempting to meet on a, uh, a, middle, uh, a middle ground, essentially, uh, where uh, both sides would be positively impacted rather than one side simply um, being better and sort of imperialistically providing them with a replacement for their traditional culture. Uh, so, and indeed, what we find is that the Unitarians were affected by, by this uh, sort of encounter. But also um, just the idea that religion... Jeff, I wanted to see if Joanne had a question oh, before we got too far down the road. She had a question a little while back. He's still... Uh, it's okay, but th this, this does uh, put us on a different road, the, qu the question that I wanted to ask, since we have limited mm -hmm. amounts of time. Um, and that is, Jeff, more about your thoughts on um, modern Unitarian Universalism and Buddhism, and maybe even your own path. We obviously are having uh, UU congregants who are attracted to Buddhism, want to know more about it. Do you think that there is a specific spiritual hunger um, that, that Buddhism addresses? Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk uh, more modern. It is true, I think this was maybe your original intention with the question. My apologies. A, a historian can't help talking about history. Well, I actually... Uh, at great I'm, detail, I'm unless, unless someone interrupts you... Uh, I'm listening well, and thinking... ...give a conference presentation, right? So let me I've been thinking we should have you here twice, you know, because the history is so riveting. And and I the, the modern history, too. Um, but, you know, I, I'm... So many of these things. I mean, I, I've read your essay, but um, I'm just picturing it as you tell it. As Patrice said, it's just such a story. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm a little resistant to jumping out of it into into the present day. But so, if there are any other amazing amazing stories like that before you jump to the present, you know, yeah. should, should we have Jeff come back if he would agree? I think we're going to have to sometime if he will. We'll have to see how the schedule works, of course. But uh, uh, I'm 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 happy to uh, be here as as uh, my schedule does allow. Uh, let me go ahead and fast forward quickly, since we are at about the 45 minute mark here, and I don't want to uh, fail to address more recent times because I find them uh, equally interesting, actually. Um, so uh, what we find uh, uh, very quickly is that there's sort of periods that occur. Um, there's initial uh, curiosity about um, uh, Buddhism, uh, followed by uh, deeper learning about it, and selective um, uh, appropriation, I don't mean this in a pejorative manner, of um, uh, ideas from Buddhism, and uh, so people begin to uh, talk about uh, this idea from Buddhism or that idea of Buddhism and contemplate them in a, in a more personalized way. Um, and then it's quite some time before people begin to develop into having some sort of actual tangible practice uh, related to Buddhism. Uh, that's really uh, the most recent stage of uh, this, uh, this history uh, relationship. And uh, I would uh, uh, say that it's um, uh, the strong one at this point, though. Uh, to speak to your question, Joanne, um, what I observe is that uh, there is an ongoing hunger. This is not a particularly new phenomenon, uh, but it persists uh, a hunger for uh, something to do, essentially, within uh, Unitarian Universalism. This was especially apparent in the 1980s into the 1990s um, when uh, sort of um, a particular uh, wave of a certain type of uh, humanism had uh, essentially captured uh, Unitarian Universalism, or at least captured the mainstream of the conversation, and uh, had uh, squeezed out, in many cases, uh, uh, other conversations about uh, spiritual practice, uh, about uh, uh, emotions and religion and these sort of things. There was a, a very sort of a rationalist uh, moment uh, that uh, the denomination went through. Um, it was a natural evolution of previous trends, but it was also something that uh, many people felt uh, sort of uh, impoverished by, I suppose. And so uh, people were not looking for irrationality or uh, to revert to uh, mere traditionalism or formalism or anything, but they were looking for uh, something to do uh, uh, 
you know, some sort of spiritual practice, some sort of discipline, perhaps we might suggest, uh, uh, personally, voluntarily taken on, uh, which would uh, provide them with uh, some sort of uh, spiritual uh, uh, experience, I suppose. I'm speaking in very general terms here. So we had explorations of, among other things, uh, neo-paganism, uh, various uh, uh, other uh, religious traditions. People, uh, in some cases, look to uh, uh, sort of uh, resuscitate uh, the Christian elements of uh, Unitarianism and Universalism. Others uh, look to Judaism, especially if they had uh, Jewish family roots. And uh, many people looked into uh, Buddhism. And what we found is that over time, Buddhism appears to have been the one which has uh, become the preferential option uh, among uh, contemporary Unitarian Universalists. Uh, there's many elements of Buddhism that you use are not strongly engaged with. Uh, but one thing that does seem very attractive is the practices uh, particularly uh, meditative practices, which uh, come out of uh, Buddhism, so that you'll find that people will go to church services on Sunday morning, uh, and uh, they may be uh, sort of a humanist in their uh, general uh, outlook on life and approach to uh, religion and uh, science and so on, uh, but they'll also be uh, uh, very uh, personally invested in uh, some sort of meditation practice that they do on uh, a daily uh, basis. and um, they may uh, read uh, uh, Buddhist books. You'll find them on their uh, nightstand there. Uh, read something by the Dalai Lama or Thich Nhat Hanh or someone else before going to bed or maybe in the morning to contemplate throughout the day. So it's a sort of a selective appropriation of those tools from within Buddhism which uh, appear to provide um, things that Unitarian Universalism seems to lack. Uh, Unitarian Universalism has many strengths, but um, the providing of specific tradition-connected uh, religious practices. These, this is not one of its strong points, right? So uh, that's one benefit that people seem to find from uh, practicing uh, Buddhism. Of course, that's only one approach. And meditation is uh, by no means the only way in which to engage in Buddhist practice. But uh, what we find is a very large number of Unitarian Universalist churches um, actually are hosts to uh, Buddhist meditation groups. Uh, some of them actually founded by the church members themselves. Uh, that's the situation in my church here in uh, Kitchener in uh, southern Ontario. Uh, our minister is is a Buddhist, uh, as well as obviously being a Unitarian Universalist minister. And uh, she leads a uh, uh, Wednesday night uh, meditation group, which is quite explicitly uh, based on uh, Buddhist principles and um, has a very healthy showing of primarily people from the congregation but also attracts people from out of the general uh, population as well. Um, this is a pattern that we see, and um, perhaps as much as 10% uh, or maybe even more of uh, UU uh, congregations in North America housing sp some sort of a Buddhist meditation group, which is used uh, heavily by uh, at least uh, some, some members of the church itself. So they're not simply renters, you know, uh, but uh, they're actually... Mm -hmm. Uh, church uh, programs themselves. This has become a, a very uh, widespread uh, phenomenon. Uh, we are definitely going to have to have you back. Um, I have a question from Janice Cook, one of our viewers, um, mm -hmm. who is loving this and finds it fascinating. She's a Dharma teacher teaching at First Unitarian in Rochester, and it looks like she's also doing some work around nonviolence. And she asks, can you give me any text in Buddhism that point to the inherent true nature as the source of the vow of nonviolence? That's very interesting. Well, uh, uh, Janice, I, I'm afraid we'd have to discuss a little further by what you mean by inherent true nature. Uh, Buddhism is, uh, uh, in many modes, quite skeptical about the idea of some sort of a essential essence uh, to a person, right? Uh, this is the uh, concept of uh, no self. So uh, in some ways, it, it probably would not uh, uh, be a, a very uh, easy sort of thing to find. On the other hand, there are ideas around uh, Buddha nature, which one finds in the Mahayana tradition which can sometimes be interpreted in that way. Um, the fact that uh, all beings have Buddha nature as a source of nonviolence, uh, I have to say that uh, no scriptures are coming immediately to mind, but I would encourage you to look at uh, the writings of Thich Nhat Hanh, a well-known uh, Buddhist monk and uh, peace activist. Uh, you'll certainly find uh, great support, uh, as well as very nice prose, 
uh, in his books uh, around uh, around this idea. Um, this is not to say that uh, Buddhists have not been uh, generally supportive of nonviolence as a sort of a cultural orientation. We find that uh, is quite common and mainstream in, in uh, Asian Buddhist history. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a little more tricky to find uh, exactly the sort of text you're looking for. Uh, Janice, uh, I, I, I uh, am happy to uh, take an email from you uh, later on to see if uh, we can hash out uh, what you're seeking and maybe I can make some more uh, specific uh, suggestions there. It, um, I'm curious as you watch, I'm really, I'm familiar with the Vipassana community specifically. Can you hear me okay? I do hear you. Okay, great. And I wonder, um, in Unitarian Universalist congregations, as Buddhism, as you say, you know, is so often part of it, do you tend to see Zen, Vipassana, all of the above? Um, do, you, do you have any sense of that? I mean, I always think of Vipassana Buddhism as kind of you you Buddhism because it's it's you know kind of the the softer gentler Buddhism that at least my kind of apostasy is um, but I'm just curious if you if you see any trends there and the sure. one person here who stuttered Zen says hey <laughs> <laughs> you so, know maybe, uh, maybe out west it's different I don't know uh, actually we do see regional differences uh, but um, uh, the question essentially is what sort of Buddhist traditions do Unitarian Universalists uh, seem to be uh, most often uh, lining themselves with or uh, uh, engaging with, uh, let's say. So um, I would say that the uh, Vipassana tradition is uh, a, quite a prominent one at this point, uh, maybe maybe a dominant one, uh, and there are uh, very good reasons for that. It is a relatively um, stripped down form of Buddhism. It itself is a modern creation. It's not um, a traditional form of Buddhism, but is uh, a modernist creation in Asia originally um, of uh, basically the early uh, uh, through uh, later uh, 19th century. Uh, the funny thing is it was created originally by uh, extremely ascetic forest monks. So for this to be now the, uh, the uh, friendlier, gentler version of uh, Buddhism, it's a, it's a bit ironic. It's, it's uh, uh, migrated quite a bit from its original uh, intentions. But that's not to say that's a problem. Uh, changing Buddhism to meet the needs of different demographics is, uh, is actually a core tenet of the uh, uh, religion itself. Uh, anyway, so we do see a lot of this Vipassana. Um, Zen was quite uh, important in the 20th century uh, in bringing uh, Buddhists and Unitarians in contact with one another. And it remains quite an important tradition, um, I think, for um, uh, Buddhist UUs. Uh, there's a lot of Tibetan material these days. Um, we find other people as well, uh, some Nichiren practitioners. Uh, I myself am uh, ordained in uh, the uh, Jodo Shinshu uh, tradition of uh, Japanese Pure Land Buddhism. I trained uh, in the monastery in Japan, uh, and uh, that's uh, where I hold my ordination. And I serve as a uh, sort of an assistant minister at the uh, temple in Toronto. Um, so we find a diversity of different traditions in, uh, in, in Buddhism, and many people enjoy the opportunity to uh, uh, be exposed to uh, different sorts of traditions. So one will find uh, that a person uh, maybe uh, primarily does Vipassana meditation themselves, uh, but uh, reads books by Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, technically a Vietnamese uh, Zen tradition teacher, and uh, will have a deep appreciation for the 14th Dalai Lama and his uh, activities and so on. So uh, in a very UU style of uh, uh, finding uh, what seems to be good and beneficial in various places and uh, seeking to uh, uh, craft uh, one's own uh, sort of uh, theology from these things. Uh, we find that uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, Buddhism to be uh, very much a UU style, I would suggest. And one last question. This um, month, our theme for worship in the CLF is solitude. And a lot of people really struggle with the nature of enjoying solitude. I wonder what you think uh, meditation might offer people who, are, who don't really know how to be alone and at peace. Meg, I'm afraid the uh, end of your comments uh, cut out there. But, Sorry. Uh, you're asking I, yeah. mm -hmm. Sorry, I muted so fast. I wonder what you, what you would say that meditation could offer to people who are struggling to feel at peace when we are alone. Well, you know, one interesting fact about uh, meditation, of course, uh, traditionally it is not practiced alone in Buddhism, but is actually a corporate activity. 
uh, it, it's it's done in uh, meditation halls typically, right? Although there is also the the uh, uh, the person on retreat or the person the hermit on in his cave on top of a mountain. We do have these models as well, uh, though they're less common. Um, uh, but essentially, what I would say is that uh, meditation in the Buddhist tradition strikes a rather nice balance, even when you're doing it by yourself somewhere. Uh, meditation is designed to uncover the central truths of Buddhism that we are all, in fact, interconnected with everyone and everything else in, in the world. So uh, one may uh, seem to be alone uh, in a room somewhere, and yet one is uh, uh, sifting down through the self to discover the connections with a much greater uh, reality, social reality uh, included. So uh, it's a sort of a solitude with everyone else? Does that make any sort of sense? Uh, Buddhism, uh, Buddhist meditation often starts with an I orientation, but uh, when practiced in a healthy manner, I would, I would argue that it eventually leads to a sort of a, a, a we consciousness rather than a, than a sort of a narcissism or something there. Uh, just my initial thoughts on this question about the Buddhism and solitude for what they're worth. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thanks so much to everyone for coming and spending an hour with Dr. Jeff Wilson. We'd love to have you back. I hope that we can work out the schedule at some point. Hank, you trying to say something there? No, no, just good stuff. It was good, yeah, good stuff to hear. Good yeah. stuff. Good I do want to I do want to take a brief moment to send a shout out to the UU Buddhist Fellowship at uubf.org. Uh, they do meet every two years. They have a convocation, the next one in 2015 in New York, where uh, Zen, Theravada, um, Mahayana, <coughs> different uh, UUs who practice Buddhism uh, gather in community. It's a beautiful thing. Right, and remember, it's UUBF, not BFUU. So, this, so you're, if your best friend is UU, it's a whole different website. <laughs> whole different website. Good point. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right, my BFs, I'll see you next week. See you next week. Bye, folks. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very Bye, much. Bye, everyone. everyone.